let's start. Just close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And then open your eyes. And a world appears. I mean, this seems the most natural thing ever, right? No conscious effort is required. It, our eyes, our ears, all our senses just seem to be these, these windows onto an external reality that comes into view through our senses. Here's a, an example of that. This is actually my summer holiday from a couple of years ago. You know, there's this beautiful world full of objects and people and places and rain because it was an English summer um, that just effortlessly appear when we're conscious. And then there's the specific experience of, of being you. There's the experience of self, of being the subject of experience. Now, again, no conscious effort is required. You don't have to think about it. It's always there in the background, the experience of being a self. Now, how to explain these things? In, in a sense, you might not think there's anything that needs explaining. This is just the most natural thing in the world. There's a world. And, and we perceive it. In fact, this is how things seem. There's an external world full of lots of people and cocktails uh, that we register through our senses, through our eyes and our ears and our other senses. And we read these, this sensory information out through something, information processing or something that's happening in our brains for, to form perceptions of these things out there in the world. That's, that's how things seem. But how things seem is often a pretty poor guide to how they actually are. And of course, that's, I think, the business of science is trying to pick apart this difference between how things seem and how they are. So it seems like the, uh, the, it seems like the sun rotates around the Earth, and it seems like we're at the center of everything. And of course, that's not how things are. The Earth rotates around the sun, and the whole solar system is right at the edge of the galaxy, and the galaxy's rotating around God knows what, and, and space doesn't exist anyway, and things are not as they seem in astronomy. And I want to try and argue that there's something similar going on with perception. So as a neuroscientist, I'm not trying to understand the nature of the universe, but I'm trying to understand how this, this tofu-textured meat machine that each of us has in between our ears can generate the inner universe, the inner universe full of perceptions, sights, sounds, smells, emotions, thoughts, beliefs, hopes, and expectations that define our conscious lives. This, the broadest problem here is the problem of consciousness. Now, somehow, within each of your brains, within each of everybody's brains, the combined activity of about 90 billion neurons, each one a tiny biological machine, is giving rise to this, this inner universe, this world, this experience of the world and of the self within it. Now, how that happens has been one of the, the longest standing and, and most you know, often argued about and apparently mysterious questions in science and philosophy and religion for hundreds if not thousands of years, so we're not, I'm sorry, going to solve it this evening. Uh, but I think there's a lot of progress being made. And the particular way I like to think about consciousness is not to try to solve the whole problem in, in one go and say, ah, it's that, you know, it's this neuron, that's the consciousness neuron. It's rather to try to explain or to build explanatory bridges, build bridges between what we know happens in brains and what conscious experience are actually like. It's not just the fact that they're conscious, it's the fact that my visual experience has a particular character that's different from, let's say, an emotion, or even a smell, or a memory. How can we explain these sorts of, of differences? And once we can explain the nature of experience, why experiences are the way they are, then the hope is this big mystery that consciousness is part of the universe, and that some things have it, we all have it, but probably this table doesn't, and I'm pretty sure my phone doesn't either, although I'm less convinced over time. Uh, and octopuses we'll talk about later. Uh, some things have it, other things don't. And that still might remain a mystery, but once we can understand what exper why experiences are the way they are, I think that mystery will fade away. And there's an analogy here, which is the way we've come to understand life. Now, it wasn't that long ago that life was considered very mysterious too. Most scientists of the day and most thinkers thought that Life couldn't be explained just by mechanisms. There had to be some sort of special source, some um, elan vital, some spark of life that would explain the difference between the living and the non-living. And of course, we no longer think that way. 
Once biologists got on with the job of explaining the properties of living systems like metabolism and reproduction and homeostasis in terms of things happening inside brains and, and bodies, this basic mystery of what life is started to fade away. And we, we really don't think there's a big mystery there anymore. And so I think the same approach is likely to work, or hopefully will work, with consciousness. Once we start to understand its properties, we can this big mystery of what it is might start to recede. So let's get back to, to consciousness and back to the visual world and start really simple. Our eyes open our brains to this world of vision that we all enjoy. But the photoreceptors in our eyes are only sensitive to a tiny slice of the electromagnetic spectrum, just this bit here of all the energy that's continually impinging and bombarding, bombarding us. This thin slice of reality is where we live. It's very selective already. And even within this thin slice of reality, things are not as they seem. There's a big difference between what's out there and what, what we perceive. And um, there's many kind of fun ways to demonstrate this. This is the point where I hope it works. It always depends on, on the, the particular setup. But what I'd like you to do is focus your attention and just stare at this black cross at the middle of the screen and try not to blink and try not to move your eyes too much. Just look at it for a bit. And tell me if you see, hands up, I, can, I can't see the people sitting on the floor above, but on this floor, put your hands up if uh, you see a green circle going round. Okay, does anybody not see the green circle going round? Okay, a, one, okay. Well, maybe. We'll talk afterwards. Um, <laughs> but now blink and move your eyes, and you'll see the magenta patches reappear. Yeah? So there is no green disk in this image at all. Uh, there's just all that's going on. It's called a lilac chaser illusion. I really like it. There's, all there is happening is there are magenta patches which are appearing and disappearing one after each other. And there are actually three different things happening. Uh, in your visual brain at the moment. The first is something called Troxler fading, which is if you focus somewhere and then if there's stuff further out in the periphery of your vision, now that, if it's got an indistinct boundary, it will fade away. The second thing that's happening is apparent motion. So when things go on and off near each other, uh, we tend to infer and perceive motion uh, between them. That's, of course, what happens when we watch films or videos. We see motion even though it's a series of static images. And the third thing is color opponency. In, in the color space that your brain creates, magenta is the um, opposite of, of green. And this is actually, it gets a bit more funny here because, I mean, we've known from, from Newton that, that colors aren't really objective properties of the world. You know, our brain creates colors from mixtures of, of wavelengths. But magenta exists even less than other colors. And the reason is, if you, if you want to get magenta, you mix red and blue light together and you get magenta. But if you think about the electromagnetic spectrum, you have red, blue, and there's green in the middle. Um, and it, obviously, the light isn't actually colored, but those are the wavelengths that, that we then experience as having associated with those colors. And so if you mix red and blue light together, the brain is expecting green. But if there's no green wavelength, it doesn't really know what to do, so it invents something, and it, what it invents is magenta. So magenta is not green, so when you see green there, that's actually not not green. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so how do we understand that? The way to understand this, and this is the key idea that, that we're going to just explore this evening, is that the brain is a prediction machine, that w everything you see hear, feel, and experience is your brain's best guess about the causes of your sensory inputs. Now, that's the, the simple idea. Let's unpack it a bit more. Imagine being a brain. Imagine you are a brain. You're, there you are. You're locked inside this bony vault, this bony prison of your skull, and you're trying to figure out what's out there in the world so you can decide whether to eat it or run away from it. Now, there's no light inside the skull, and there's no sound inside the skull. It's dark and it's silent. Uh, all you've got to go on as a brain are these electrical signals that come from the senses, which are only 
indirectly related to things in the world, these blurry things here, whatever they may be. Now, these electrical signals don't come with labels. They don't say, I'm from a coffee cup, or I'm from a beer, or I'm from a cat. They don't even come with labels announcing that I'm, I'm from your eyes, and I'm from your, your stomach. They're just electrical signals. So in order for the brain to uh, figure out what's causing those signals, it has to combine the incoming sensory information with prior expectations about what's out there in the world. And there's this combination of prior expectations that every brain has and the sensory data that leads to uh, our perception. So the brain doesn't hear sound or see light. What we perceive is the brain's best guess of what's out there. Now, I want to give you a couple more examples of, of how this process works. And you might have seen some of these examples before in, in, in other contexts. These are kind of, they're called always optical illusions, but I don't really like that because I think they're not really tricking your brain. They're just showing how it actually works. So in this, this example, this is called Adelson's checkerboard. And um, in Adelson's checkerboard, if you look at these two patches, A and B, they should seem to be different shades of gray, right? Does everybody see that, different shades of gray? Yeah, good. Now, they are, of course, exactly the same shade of gray. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother showing it to you. If I put up uh, another image here, you can see that it's a single color. Now, there's, no, there's no change in the shading. And if you think this is tricky, I'm showing you two different things here. If I just bring it across, you can see this really is the same shade of gray. Now you see it as the same, but if I take it away, it'll look different again. And no matter how many times you see this, this always works. And what's going on here is that your brain is using knowledge that's built very deep into the visual cortex that a cast shadow dims the appearance of a surface. And so this is under shadow, so your brain thinks, okay, that's under shadow, so it must be lighter than it appearing, so I'll perceive it as lighter. And you're not aware that your brain has this knowledge, but it's a prior belief that your brain has about the behavior of objects under shadow that interprets the sensory data and makes you perceive it in a particular way. Here's a, the second example. And you might have heard this before if you've seen uh, any previous things that I've done, in which case you'll know to not say anything. Uh, if you haven't, I'd like you to listen to this and see what you make of it. Apart from being quite loud. Uh, just anybody think what that is? Dog. Okay, let's listen one more time. So it sounds just like a bunch of noisy whistles, perhaps. Maybe a dog. Now listen to this. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. Okay, it, it's still not that clear, but it's something I really, I definitely do think, um, in case you're in any doubt. Uh, so I, that was me saying I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. Now listen to the first sound again. I'm going to play you exactly the same sound. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. It works. It's good. I always like it when it works. So you can now hear words in what previously just sounded like noisy whistles. One more time. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. Just have to drive home the mes uh, message. Um, I was in Las Vegas uh, and, and nobody... What, what, what's that? It didn't really work so well when I tried this a month ago. Um, but what's remarkable here is that the sensory information coming into your brain hasn't changed at all. All that's changed is your brain's expectations about what caused that sensory information. And that changes what you consciously hear. And it can happen so quickly that the same information can be experienced very differently. Now, this puts the brain basis of perception, or how we think about the brain basis perception, in a very, very different light. This is the kind of classic way that neuroscientists like to think about perception, or did. This is a monkey brain. This is the visual pathway that goes from the eyes up into the visual cortex, and the visual cortex starts at the back of the brain, and signals go further forward. So the, the kind of classical view is that sensory signals come in through the eyes, and as they get deeper and deeper into the visual cortex, they get processed in more complex ways. So early stages of the visual cortex deal with simple things like orientation and luminance, whereas deeper levels deal with more complex things, 
uh, conjunctions of these features like objects, people, places, and faces. And this is a monkey brain, so it's a monkey face up in the corner. But in this view, which is how things seem, right? Sensory signals come in and, and we sort of read them out. In this view, this perception, perception is done in this outside-in or bottom-up direction. Now, the prediction machine view of perception changes that around completely. So instead of perception depending on sensory signals coming into the brain from the outside world, it depends just as much, if not more, on perceptual predictions flowing in the opposite direction. So that we don't just passively perceive our worlds, we actively generate them all the time. And thinking this way actually gives us a handle on how brains do what they do. This is definitely the too complex slide. It doesn't have to be this complex. But it's giving us a handle on how we understand the way the brain is wired up. And the basic idea is that we can think of the brain as lots of different levels. So early levels near the senses, then uh, deeper levels and still deeper levels as we get deeper and deeper into the brain. And what's happening here is that uh, signals that are coming from the inside out, these blue arrows, are, are carrying the brain's predictions about activity in the level below all the way down to the sensory organs, the eyes and the ears. And what's coming in from the outside world and gets passed into the brain isn't you know, some picture of the world out there. It's simply the error, the discrepancy between what the brain expects and what it gets at every stage and every level. So all that's coming in are prediction errors, not... Um, the contents of something out there in the world. And perception then becomes uh, a continual process of the minimization of this prediction error all the time, which has a weird thought to this, that actually you could perceive, and perhaps you would perceive most accurately, whatever that might mean, if you had no information coming into the brain at all, because that would mean your predictions were perfectly explaining away the data at all stages. Um, and that's a powerful framework to work with in neuroscience. Now, there's a lot of experiments that are testing these ideas, and I'm not going to go into the, the details of, of, indiv of many individual experiments, because uh, it's kind of dull. Uh, but I'll just give you one idea of the kind of study that we've been doing in my lab. And this is a very simple experiment. We've done a lot of brain imaging stuff, too. But this, this just asks a very straightforward question. Do we see what we expect to see, or do we see what violates our expectations. You could think of it either way. It's natural to think that perception is more suited to detecting things that, we, that are not already predicted to be there. Uh, but what I'm saying perhaps suggests the opposite. So what we did in this experiment was we showed these two images to different eyes. So in one eye, you would see this changing pattern of shapes. Uh, and in the other eye, you would see either a face or a house. And the, the contrast would ramp like this. So at some point, you would see the image. And the question is, if people were expecting to see a face, did, this, did they see the face more quickly? Did it break through into their consciousness more easily? And the answer is basically across a whole bunch of studies that it does. So we, in this case, we see what we expect to see, not what violates our expectations. And actually, this has quite a lot of implications because these expectations are not just things that we don't have to just tell people ex expect to see a face or expect to see a house. Things like social stereotypes constitute expectations. You might expect somebody from a particular uh, race or culture to be associated with a particular object, let's say a gun or, or a power drill or something like that. And that will change. These expectations can drill down, change what you actually perceive without you knowing it. So it's not really, I'll believe it when I see it, but it's more, I'll see it when I believe it. Uh, is how we should think in this inverted way, thinking about perception. Now, how do we go from like, these simple experiments about seeing a face or seeing a house to understanding something about the richness and the complexity of the visual and you know, multi-sensory worlds that we inhabit in our everyday lives, like this rainy day uh, in Devon. And here I want to make just a short connection, which was unexpected for me in thinking about these things, to a guy called Ernst Gombrich, who's an art historian, one of the classic 20th century art historians, who basically had come up with much the same idea in the 1940s and 1950s. And he called it the beholder's share. And I really like it because it, it, it connects a similar idea about prediction, perception, but to it puts it in a much richer context about experience, because he's talking about art. 
And he says it's the power of expectation rather than the power of conceptual knowledge that molds what we see in life no less than in art. So there's this common thing going on when we look at art or when we look around us, that it's the expectations about what's there that's driving uh, what, we, what we perceive. And there's another thing he says, which I think is really valuable, is there's no innocent eye. You can't perceive what you can't classify. So there are just things that we are not able to perceive because we can't predict what the sensory signals would be from those things. It shows there's a very close relationship between perception and imagination. We, to perceive something, we need, strictly speaking, to be able to imagine it. Now, these ideas, I think, work for me most powerfully when we think about things like impressionist art. I mean, I, I, I love this kind of stuff. It's great. I mean, it, it, wh what's happening here is you've got all these basically pretty ambiguous scrapings of color on a, on a canvas, but they evoke a powerful impression, if you're far enough away, of a river and trees and, and dappled sunlight and all this. And in order to paint this picture, what's happening is the artist has to effectively say, Monet has to reverse engineer the visual system, because he's not painting the output of the visual system, he's reverse engineering, trying to paint light, trying to paint, in, trying to pa paint the input. And this requires a deep understanding of how vision works. So I think it's the, the second sort of, I don't want to get too diverted here, but for me, a lot of people talk about the relationship between neuroscience and art as a bit sort of hierarchical, that we, we have people look at paintings and we'll put them in brain scanners and we'll watch what happens when they see a nice picture and go, ooh. Now, I don't think it's like that at all. I think art and neuroscience are very much equal partners in trying to understand the nature of human experience. Here's another example, which is objects. So when, especially in vision, when we look around, the objects that we see, like my phone here, we perceive them as having a, like a three-dimensional extension, a volume in space. So in some sense, I perceive the back of this object, even though I don't directly see it. And that's not the case when I look up into a, a featureless blue sky or gray sky, or when I look at a picture of a pipe. You know, that's, that's what's going on in this Magritte image here. This is not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe. So how do we understand this type of visual experience, the, uh, the appearance of things in the world as objects? Well, the prediction machine view has a, has a suggestion for this, which is that I will perceive something as an object if my brain is able to predict not only what the causes of my current sensory input is, but how that would change when I make actions or when it moves. So in, in this sense, I perceive the, this phone as a three-dimensional thing because my brain is predicting how it would, what would happen, what, my, what sensory signals would change if I were to move it or move around it. And that's why I can perceive it as having a back even when I don't see it. And that sounds kind of a bit abstract and, and weird, but what's nice and exciting now is we can start to test some of these ideas uh, in the lab using augmented and virtual reality techniques. So this, if you can see it, this was my uh, colleague Kesuke Suzuki, and we've designed a whole bunch of unfamiliar objects which you can interact with, and they either behave as a normal object would, or in this case, they don't really behave at all. They just show you the same face, whatever you do to it. Uh, and in the final example is an object that does respond to your actions, but in weird and unpredictable ways. So we can now explicitly manipulate how objects depend on your actions, and then ask the questions like, how does that change your perception of them? And this is still ongoing work, but what we're finding is that objects that behave in ways that that are predictable are, again, easier to see and have distinct perceptual properties. So we can start to get at the phenomenology of, phenomenology of objected uh, in this view. And one other aspect that we can start to investigate, and this gets back to the title of the talk, is hallucination. So hallucination we typically think of as a case where people perceive something that's not there. And why do we say it's not there? Well, because nobody else perceives it. So it's a kind of social definition, really. You nobody else sees it apart from you. You must be hallucinating. Uh, I mean, we've all seen faces in clouds and, and things like that, and we, faces in anything, really. Um, and we can see this as a, as a sort of hallucination, too. So in trying to understand what's going on in hallucination, we can think of it in, in a way in which the brain is, is predicting things about the world, but these predictions are not being sufficiently constrained or reined in by the sensory data. So the predictions are overwhelming the sensory data in a way that, that they don't uh, 
for nor in the normal case when we're not hallucinating. So we've tried to model this, we've tried to play around with this, again using virtual reality and these, these neural networks. So there's these neural networks which you can, which you can get hold of now, which are very good. If, you, if you've got a load of photos and you really want to know what breed of dog is in any of those photos, you can just show it to the neural network and it will classify the breed of dog, which is an incredibly useful thing to do. Uh, so these, these networks basically are good at predicting the breed of a dog. And what you can do is you can run them backwards and tell the network a dog is there and have it update the image until it, it, till it sort of, the image matches its prediction. So this is what, you might have seen these images, these are from a, a method called Google Deep Dream where dogs just appear out of everything. And um, what we did uh, at my University of Sussex, we took the same method and adapted it slightly so that we could apply it to every frame of a panoramic video that we took at campus that you then put a virtual reality headset on and you look around from campus and it looks a bit like, it looks a bit like this. So this is campus on a Tuesday afternoon and there are a few too many dogs. <laughs> now, even dogs in the sky, if you look up, you see dogs in the sky, we can't quite see them there. But what's interesting here, it's not like, it's not that, that people have just photoshopped dogs onto a, onto a movie, right? The dogs are, are appearing out of the image at all levels in a way that is not entirely accidentally resembling certain kinds of altered states of consciousness. Um, it's not necessarily the kinds of hallucinations that you get in psychosis or schizophrenia, but... Uh, for those of you who've tried other sorts of altered states of consciousness, there are some similarities. Um, and I think this is very interesting because it's, it's showing, by, by showing how you can tilt the balance, it's revealing something I think quite fundamental about when we perceive a dog, it's because we're predicting the dog to be there. It's just normally uh, we're not over predicting the dog to be there. And when we turn up the predictions, this is what happens. Um, I think I'll skip that. That one. Um, so the way to think about hallucination in this view is as a kind of uncontrolled perception where the sensory day that we're getting in is not updating our perceptual predictions, not helping them grab on and keep a hold of the external reality that's there. So if we think of hallucination as an uncontrolled perception, well, that means we can also think of perception as a kind of hallucination. It's a continuum. But Normal perception is a controlled hallucination in which the brain's perceptual predictions are reined in and updated by sensory data in a way that's very similar for all of us. So in a sense, you could say we are all hallucinating all the time. It's just that when we agree about our hallucinations, that's what we call reality. <laughs> what? <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, so that's the, 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 the summary of, of the main bit of the talk, really, that, that, um, that what we perceive, the contents of our consciousness, is the brain's best guess of the causes of its sensory input, a kind of controlled hallucination. So what I want to do in the second part of the talk is argue that this applies not just to how we experience the world, but also to how we experience being a self, how we experience being you or being me. This is also a kind of controlled hallucination. And this just seems a bit weird, on, right? I mean, it's one thing to show you a bunch of visual illusions and convince you that two, sh two patches are in fact the same shade of gray when they're not, uh, or the other way around. Uh, but it's another thing entirely to argue that this basic sense of being you is also a construction, a neuronal fantasy that's guided by reality. But that's exactly what I think is going on. Uh, now, the first thing to recognize about the self is that it seems like, and again, this is, thing, this is a difference between how things seem and how things are, it seems like, for most of us, most of the time, that we have this unified sense of self, that there is a single me inside, me somewhere, that, 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 that just is me, that bundles together all the different aspects uh, that being me entails. But there are many, in fact, different ways in which we can experience being a self and do all the time. There's the bodily self, the experience of being a body and of having a particular body. This is my body, this isn't. 
those things aren't. Um, there's the perspectival self, the experience of perceiving the world from a particular first-person point of view, usually in the body, but not always. Then there's the volitional self, the experience of intending to do things or being the cause of things that happened. And all these levels of self, there's no need for a name or an I. These are all levels of self that, that lie below a sense of identity. It's only when you get to what we might call the narrative and the social self that we start to think about a series of memories that are linked together over time that define you as a person. And of course, you as a person also depends on how you perceive others perceiving you. That's the social self. Uh, now, we know from psychiatric clinics and also from lab experiments that these different aspects of self can and do come apart, while others might remain. And what that means is that this sense of a unified self that we have, I mean, it's, it's there. We do have this sense of unity. But it's, it's not to be taken for granted. It's a continual construction, again, put together by the brain. So I'm going to focus for time just on the bodily self. What uh, defines the experience of being and having a particular body? And just the same principles apply. The brain decides what is or what is not its body based on its best guess about the causes of signals that it associates with uh, a body. And there's one uh, brilliant example of this. This is a really fun experiment to do. Now, this is unlike most neuroscience experiments. You can do this one at home. All you need is a, is a I'm sure you all have a, a fake hand. If you happen to have a fake hand at home and a couple of paint brushes, you can do the rubber hand illusion. Now, how many of you are familiar with the rubber hand illusion? Uh, quite a few of you, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's great. I've seen it. it gets better every time you watch it. So in the rubber hand illusion, what happens is that a person's real hand is hidden from sight, and this fake rubber hand is placed in front of them. Then the experimenter strokes both the real hand and the rubber hand in time with each other while the person focuses their attention on the fake hand. And the idea here is that this congruence between seeing touch and feeling touch on an object that looks like a hand and is roughly where a hand should be is enough evidence for the brain to reach its best guess. <laughs> that the hand is, in fact, part of its body. And that's, that's, the, that's the proper way to test it. Uh, definitely. Actually, we did... Um, we, did uh, we started to look at individual differences in this, and we just finished last week at Sussex. We, we ran this experiment without the stabbing the hand bit. Uh, we, we ran this whole experiment on the entire first-year psychology intake. So we did 364 rubber hand experiments in a week, which was, which was this whole rubber hand factory. It was kind of, it was kind of fun. Um, but what this shows is that, is that the surprising changeability in what the brain can decide is or is not part of its body, just the same way that it constructs what's out there in the world on the basis of best guessing. And you can take this even further uh, to the whole body and the first-person perspective. In, in this... Uh, demonstration which we set up at the British Science Festival last year, what happens is two people wear headsets and there are cameras on the headsets and what, what we do is we swap the feed of the camera. So this person sees what's coming into the camera from this person, they face each other and then they shake hands which gives them this critical multi-sensory stimulation. So they're getting tactile input, visual input and proprioceptive input. And again, for a lot of people, not for everybody, for a lot of people, this leads to this very uncanny feeling of suddenly being outside their body, shaking hands with themselves from an out-of-body perspective. Uh, so that's, an, you, it's, it's again, it's something we might take for granted, like where I am in space and what, what, where my consciousness is in relation to the world. That is also something that's constructed on the fly. And there's an important implication here, which is that when people report things like out-of-body experiences, which has happened in all cultures for thousands of years, you don't deny that people have these experiences. They do have the experiences they say they have. It just means we should not necessarily accept the explanations they give for these experiences. You don't have to assume that the soul, if there is a soul, has left the brain and is floating around by the ceiling. No, you just have to say that whatever the circumstances were, they led the brain to reach an unusual best guess about where the first person perspective was located. So this is a message for, for you know, just as we can think of perception of the world as a controlled hallucination, we can think of perception of the self, at least the bodily self, as a 
similar kind of perceptual best guess. So whereas Descartes would have said, I think, therefore I am, I prefer to say, I predict myself, therefore I am. Now, I want to return now, in the last 10 minutes, just to this distinction between how things seem and, and, and how they are. So this is where we started. We started with this idea of there's a, a world out there full of objects, people, and places that we detect through our senses, uh, and there's a self inside somehow that's receiving the sensory data and through mechanism of perception forms this representation of the outside world. That's how things seem. We read out our sensory data. Something in here does that. That's not what's going on at all. I don't think it is anyway. What's actually happening is that it's not the self that does the perceiving. The self itself is a perception constructed by just the same principles that our experience of the world is constructed. Now, not exactly the same. There are differences between self and, and world, and we'll come to a couple of those as I, as I close. But basically, it, it does shift things, I think, rather dramatically, that we, once we can start to understand that our, our experiences of who we are is, is not to be taken for granted. It's not given. It's equally subject to the same influences, biases, shaping, changing over time that our experience of the world is. Then we can start to maybe think of who we are a little bit differently. So just in the last, how, how, how much more time do I have? About five minutes? Ten minutes? Five minutes? Never. Um, never. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I want to take you a bit further down the rabbit hole in, in what we're doing in the lab to push this uh, idea of prediction machine a bit as far as we can take it. Uh, and so the first thing is, is perception of the body from the inside. So, so far I've mainly talked about vision, touch, uh, some of the more familiar senses. But in fact, a large part of our brain is dedicated to perceiving and regulating the internal condition of the physiology of our body. In fact, if you think about it, that's what brains are ultimately for. They're not for doing complex thinking, solving crossword puzzles, giving talks about neuroscience, um, or, or even speaking. They are for keeping the body alive. That's the primal function of, of, having, of having a brain, keeping it alive and, and, and moving. And Interoception refers to all those processes that detect and control signals that tell, you know, telling the brain something like what the, how the heart is doing, what blood pressure levels are like, is the gut distended or not, am I hungry, and so on. Um, and so since this is so fundamental, we wondered, uh, there are many ideas about how this sense of the body from within might shape these deep experiences of being a body, not just having a body, but being a body. And I wanted to show you one experiment we did um, a few years ago now in the lab where we did the version of the rubber hand illusion, but we used a virtual hand rather than the rubber hand. So people put their real hand and we mapped it with some uh, um, motion capture stuff and projected it back into their headset. And the key thing here was that we made the virtual hand flash red and back, flash red either in time or out of time with the person's heartbeat. And what we found is that when it flashed in time with their heartbeat, this virtual hand, people had a stronger sense that it was part of their body than when it didn't. And um, so this shows that the brain's putting together signals from both inside and outside the body when deciding what in the world its body is. This is what it looks like, uh, kind of roughly. These, these, you'd see these in, in the two eyes, so you'd see a three-dimensional version of this. And you can probably just see it's pulsing to red and back a little bit. This is kind of old school VR from 2012, so it's not very good quality. Uh, but this has been replicated in, in various forms by various different labs. And one thing I found very interesting, this is not work we did, but um, as well as just being interesting and fun, it might also be useful. So this group, I forget where they were now, uh, in Switzerland, they showed, that, um, by, they showed that by using this method of having virtual hands pulsing in time with the heartbeat, they actually reduced chronic pain in people who were suffering from chronic pain in, in their limbs, which I think is, is really very interesting. There's a lot we can talk about how pain relates to prediction, too. But the deeper message here about consciousness and phenomenology is that I think we can start to understand something very fundamental, which is, as I was talking about before, when we perceive the outside world, we perceive it in terms of objects and the spaces between them, especially in vision. But when we think about the body, we don't really experience our 
interior of our body in terms of objects. I don't know what shape my liver is or where it is really. I don't experience it as an object in my body. What I experience is how well or badly the regulation of my body is going. We experience that as a deep sense of embodiment and as emotion and mood and so on. And, that, and I think this falls very naturally out of this way of thinking of perception because vision is, is really about we need to know what's out there distant from our bodies. But perception of the inside of the body is about control and regulation, not figuring out what's there. So the kind of experience that we have for a prediction depends on the kind of prediction it is. And ultimately, this, this leads us to a view of self which is, for me, very satisfying because it's, it, it starts to see the self and conscious experience of the self and the world not as something that you could program in a computer and put in a robot and have it trundle around, but something that's very, very deeply tied to our flesh and blood nature. The predictive machinery that allows us to perceive anything in the world at all had its origin and its main function in regulating and keeping the body alive. I think this link between biological life, the fundamental facts of being alive, and the nature of our conscious experience goes against a lot of what you hear about people talking about artificial intelligence becoming conscious and so on and so on. When we are, yeah, at the bottom, we're animals, and that's what gives us meaning, that's what gives us emotion, and that's what I think gives us a sense of self. Now, um, is speaking to me. So another thing about self, and this is probably the, I, I think now I'm going to start wrapping up definitely, is volition. So when uh, something most of us feel very central is the experience of intending to do things and of being the cause of things that happens. We, some people talk about this as free will. So one last experiment. I want you all to just, just clench your right fists like this somewhere in front of you, right? So you all did that. And you all probably experienced the urge to clench your, your fist, right? When, when I said it. Now, it's easy to think that that experience of intending to clench your fist caused that to happen. But what, I'm try what I want to suggest is it's not what happens at all. That the experience of volition is the result and not the cause of that voluntary action. Experiences of volition, like any other experiences, are best guesses. They're kinds of perceptions that help us explain particular combinations of, of data. And again, we can play around with this using virtual uh, reality. Here we have uh, virtual hands that can make voluntary actions. And the key thing that we can do here is we can have people make, uh, we can have these virtual hands make apparently voluntary actions that the person did not in fact make. So this virtual hand can push a button and a tone sounds. They did not make that voluntary action. And so in doing this, we can start to figure out what it takes. We can have people almost experience certain things as voluntary, even though they didn't actually make the voluntary action. Now, two more very quick things. Time is again something that we seem so fundamental. We're zooming back outside the self now. All our experiences unfold in time. Yet we don't have any time sensors in the brain. We have a biological rhythm over about 24 hours, but we don't have a stopwatch inside the head that's counting off seconds and giving us our experience of time, not that it could ever work that way anyway. So working in our lab with my colleague Warwick Roseboom, we're starting to understand time as another kind of perceptual inference. We experience duration uh, as a construction based on the rate of change of, how, of other sensory signals. So time is not something that's given. Time is something that we also construct, and which also explains why our estimates of time are sometimes not correct, and they're biased in very systematic ways. And the final thing is, um, oh, we can also build artificial systems on this principle that can perceive time in a very human-like way. And the very last thing is to get back to where we started, reality itself. Now, we experience the world usually not only as just objects and people and places, but as really existing. It seems to me that, that everybody here actually exists and these things are really there. But this, again, is not to be taken for granted because this experience of subjective reality can go away. We've all had it and things like deja vu, um, in certain kinds of lucid dreaming, you can have experiences and you know that they're not actually real. And in a lot of psychiatric conditions, dissociative conditions like derealization and depersonalization, people aren't hallucinating, but they have this subjective feeling that their experiences are no longer real. In fact, there are some extreme cases where people 
believe that they are in fact dead. This is called Cotard syndrome, which is very strange. And so I want to know what gives rise to this experience of things being real. And so what we do here, this is a technique called substitution reality, where we record a, a panoramic video, again from a, a lab in, in a room in our lab, and then we put a person at exactly the same place we recorded the video from, wearing a headset with a camera under exactly the same conditions. And under exactly these conditions, we can swap the feed from the camera to the pre-recorded video and the person won't notice. They firmly believe what they're experiencing is real, even though it's pre-recorded. And this is interesting because this doesn't typically happen in virtual reality. However convincing it is, you tend to know it's not actually real. Here we can change that. And then, of course, we can start to change the video and push it as far as we can to see how far can we push it before people's experience that this is real breaks down. And that gives us a sense of what it takes for people to experience things as real. So I want to wrap up then and talk about where we've come. So we started with vision, and we started with this idea that our vivid experiences of a world full of objects, people, and places is not a direct window onto an external reality. It's the result of the brain's efforts to continually predict the incoming sensory signals in which it swims. And this applies also to the self, that the experience of being me or you is also a construction. The self is not the thing that does the perceiving. The self itself is a perception. It's another neuronal fantasy generated by evolution to help the brain guide our behavior. And it's not just the self as the body that can be explained this way. Emotion, volition, passing of time, and the subjective sense of being real all emerge as different aspects of the brain trying to predict its own sensory flow. So the world around us and ourselves within it, these experiences are both controlled hallucinations that are designed by evolution to keep us alive in worlds full of danger and opportunity. So I close in the last 30 seconds just by a couple of implications of all this that we can talk about. First is, as I mentioned before, actually, perception and imagination are very closely tied together. If perception depends on the ability to predict where sensory signals come from, we have to be able to generate, almost self-generate, those sensory signals. We do this when we're dreaming, of course, but it shows a continuum between perception, hallucination, dreaming, and imagination. It also means that we will each inhabit slightly different inner universes, slightly different perceptual worlds. I think it's easy to overestimate the degree to which we all experience the same thing because there's a kind of social contract that requires us to agree that we all do experience the same thing most of the time, apart from when we're on social media. <laughs> and leading on from this, if we can misperceive the world in all these illusions and things, then we can also misperceive ourselves. And understanding this... I think opens many new opportunities in neurology and psychiatry because we can finally get at the mechanisms rather than just treating the symptoms when dealing with really distressing conditions like depression, schizophrenia, autism. Start to get at how is the brain misperceiving or miscontrolling the body and develop a much more fine-grained approach to psychiatry. I also mentioned this before, that, that we should worry, we should, we should perhaps not worry so much about people who think that the next generation of robots are going to develop awareness and self-awareness. Consciousness and self, I think, are much more closely tied to our nature as flesh and blood animals, our biological drive to stay alive. And of course, we share that biological drive to stay alive with other creatures. Here's the octopus. And uh, thinking of understanding that the self is a construction that happens in a particular way, also allows us to appreciate the way we experience the self and world is just one possible way in a vast space of possible minds. And for instance, the octopus, which has most of its neurons in its arms rather than its central brain, um, and has three hearts, and all sorts of other weird stuff, and can see with its skin, what would it be like to be an octopus? Could you do the rubber hand illusion on an octopus? Not sure. And finally, this brings us back to consciousness. And I I think the hope is that by trying to explain these, these really quite deep aspects of, of experience, I haven't told you how a bunch of neurons generate experience. What I've tried to convey is that by understanding how experiences are the way they are, we've actually explained what a science of consciousness should want to explain. Um, and with that, uh, I will just thank these people in my lab who did some of the work that, that I showed you about. 
The last time I was in Copenhagen was for this premiere of this film called The Most Unknown, which is a kind of weird science documentary, which is on Netflix. And if you want to know more stuff, I'll be at the bar um, and taking questions now. And there's a three and a half hour podcast with Sam Harris, which is rather long, but you can listen to that. Um, Where are what? Whoops. And a rap guide to consciousness. All this is a, also available in rap form, but not, not by me, uh, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.